Hi everybody. Welcome to part two of our three-part series, an introduction to the seven levels of process and measurement you need to master in order to do an effective processor analysis in the mainframe computing environment. I always say that the processor is your most important resource and the one of most interest because it tends to be the most expensive resource you have and for many of you it's the most limiting resource. So understanding the measurements and mastering those measurements is key. Now if you've not seen part one or part three of this series, click on the associated links and you'll get those videos as well. So again, welcome back to part two of our three-part series, an introduction to the seven levels of process and measurements you need to master in order to do an effective processor analysis in the mainframe computing environment. Now, this is the second part of our three-part series. If you watched the first part, we saw that level one, we looked at the total amount of CPU that was possible to be consumed by our machine, our processor. And level two, which was how much CPU was being used at each individual system level. This particular video is going to talk about three additional levels that you need to master. The first level we're going to discuss is looking at CPU time at the logical partition level, kind of like a system image level, only broken down even further. The next one is going to be looking at CPU time at the MVS or the ZOS operating system level in terms of how much is captured and uncaptured, and we're going to be taking a look and talking about what that means. And the third level we're going to talk about during this particular video is we're going to look at breaking up the CPU and looking at it at the granularity of a workload, at an application, at an importance level, or however, however you want to divide it up. Those are the three levels being discussed in this video. Level three. The next level of CPU time we want to understand when doing a processor analysis is a breakdown of the total amount of dispatch time for each individual operating system image and how much CPU time was consumed either doing productive work by the operating system and its workloads or what we're going to see in a moment is called LPAR management time which is the amount of CPU time that PRISM consumed doing work on behalf of the partition. So let's, let's think about that. I mentioned in the level one, we want to understand the total dispatch time or the amount of time that each individual system consumed. That time, as I mentioned here, is broken up into two times. The first time is effective dispatch time. And again, what effective dispatch time is, is the amount of CPU time that the system image itself consumed or was dispatched onto a physical processor, so it consumed CPU, and its workloads ran. Remember, if a logical partition, if a system image doesn't want to use CPU, it's not going to be dispatched. So we think of effective dispatch time as the amount of productive work that our system image was actually using CPU and running workloads. Now I mentioned the second bucket of time is what we call LPAR management time. And what LPAR management time is, again, similar to physical, it's a bucket of CPU time. Now what LPAR management time is, is the bucket of CPU time that we use to account for CPU time that PRISM spent, let's say, managing this specific partition. Really what it is, is that in a lot of cases, the system image itself, as I said, is running under PRISM because PRISM is the hypervisor. So the system image cannot actually issue what's called hardware instructions to the hardware. It has to go to PRISM to do that. So when a system image issues hardware instructions like diagnose commands and things like that, that uses up CPU time and PRISM is executing those instructions on behalf of each individual partition. So what LPAR management time is, is CPU time spent issuing those instructions or we think about it as the amount of CPU time that PRISM spent doing work on behalf of each individual operating system image. So the next level the operating system image level, which is the effective dispatch time, plus the LPAR management time. You add those two together up, and at level one, we have the total dispatch time of the LPAR. Now we know at level three, it's those two times. The next level is level four, and this is where we break down the LPAR effective dispatch time, or how much CPU time each individual system image is consuming. Now, at this point during the discussion, I want to 
focus specifically on system images running the MVS operating system, also known as ZOS. PRISM, the hypervisor, can run multiple different types of operating systems, and measurement of those operating systems are a different discussion. This discussion, we're focusing on a breakdown of MVS uh, CPU time for MVS images. Now, the breakdown of effective dispatch time is going to be into two primary components. The first component is what we call MVS captured time, and the second component is going to be called MVS uncaptured time. So let's think about that. What MVS capture time is, is this total amount of CPU time that we can account for to the operating system, meaning the MVS operating system, and to all the workloads. Now I'm going to show you in a bit how you get that calculated, but we're going to eventually calculate that at the lower levels. The point is, eventually we're going to come up with the amount of CPU time that the MVS image and all of its workloads can have consumed and that we can account for in specific measurements. But what happens is when you take all of those measurements and you add them up for the workload and the MVS operating system, they tend to be different, too little, compared to the effective dispatch time. So what we do is we take the effective dispatch time, which is the time we know the MVS system image consumed of CPU. We subtract from that the MVS capture time, which we know we can account for toward the MVS system and all of its workloads, and we come up with this uncaptured time. Now what uncaptured time is, is just that. It's the amount of CPU time that was consumed by the MVS system and its workloads that we can't account for it towards any individual measurement we have available to us. Now, what is uncaptured time? Well, that's a discussion for another video that you can find in this channel, but we just, just for now understand we can't capture it. And one of the health indicators we'll later see is how much uncaptured time do we have relative to the amount of captured time we have. Because if you have too much uncaptured time, it could be a sign of some poor system health. And that's why we need to understand what that measurement is, and we could do some debugging or diagnostics of that measurement. So level four is a breakdown of the operating system levels, uh, operating uh, system level CPU time into what we call MVS capture time and MVS uncapture time. Now level five is what I think is the most fun area to go through and this is looking at the CPU time for the system image as broken down by workload. See, on the mainframe operating system of ZOS or MVS, we can actually categorize our work into different workload categories to be able to look at the CPU time as broken down by those categories. Now understand that all work can be categorized and eventually if we take whatever work we categorize, which should be everything is my recommendation, and we add that up, that's our MVS capture time. So if you have the measurements, you add them all up, that's the MVS capture time. So what does it mean to actually break the CPU time down by workload? Well, as I said, on the MVS operating system, we have the opportunity to take all of our workloads and categorize them differently. So for example, some customers will categorize work at the workload level, which says, this is my batch, how much CPU is being used by my batch workload. This is my online, how much CPU is being used by my online workloads. These are my database workloads, how much CPU time they're consuming. These are my TSO, this is my system started tasks and you can categorize that work by workload level. But again, if you put everything into a workload and you add it up, that's gonna be your MVS capture time. Another way you can categorize work is by maybe the grouping of the work based on what it's doing. So for example, you might say, these are my production workloads. This is my production batch. This is my development batch. This is my production online. This is my development online. You can categorize work by importance level. This is my most important work, importance level one. This is my second most important work. This is my third most important work and so on. And then that way what we can do is summarize CPU time down at the importance level. Again, always at that level, if we add all the CPU time up, it's gonna equal our capture time. Another way we can do it is just categorize it by the type of application, kind of what we call application attribution. For example, you might have a workload called batch, and so that's how much batch is consuming. 
But then we can say, well, we have our nighttime batch or our batch application that does, you know, our banking transactions. We have our batch application that does our reconciliation. We have our batch transactions that do our database work. The point being is we can break the workload category down further and further. So on the mainframe operating system of MVS and ZOS, we can actually categorize our work by workloads, by importance level, by type of work, by application. But the point is, everything should be categorized, and you can do all of them, by the way, because you're going to get lots of measurements, and it's just a different way of slicing and dicing the measurements during your analysis to gain insights into what's consuming CPU, how they're consuming CPU, what the trend is in CPU growth, and all sorts of things we talk about on this channel. So looking at CPU time at the workload level and, and importance level is the next level down that we look at. And again, when added up together is going to be our MVS caption time. This concludes part two of our three-part series, an introduction to the seven levels of processor measurement you need to master in order to do an effective processor analysis in the mainframe computing environment. Now, if you're new here, please click the subscribe button, and also below you'll see a reference to a link to a paper that I've written that will summarize these seven levels. Also, if you've not seen part one or part two, please look for those links as well to those videos. Thank you.